the, the discussion will be uh, with a very broad topic, uh, science and Christianity, worldviews world in conflict, question mark. And the, uh, the speakers tonight um, will be the following. Uh, we will begin with the uh, presentation of 15 minutes by Dr. Peter Payne, uh, who's got a PhD in philosophy from Claremont Graduate University. And the top topic has been around philosophy, theology, and, and cosmology. And uh, uh, he is currently the managing director of the Institute for uh, Credible Christianity and, and has been visiting Finland several times before and, and is, uh, has spoken in various Veritas Forum events uh, before and, and will be speaking to, during his visit all, uh, this year. The other speaker will be uh, uh, Robert Proterus, um, who's, uh, uh, who's got a licentiate degree in molecular physics uh, in the University of Helsinki, and uh, who has been uh, and still is very active in the um, Free Thinkers Union of Finland and uh, the Skeptic Society and, and the Humanist Association of, of Finland and has written numerous articles, around 100 articles, about the topics between Christianity, atheism, and, and, and worldviews in general. Um, he will also present 15 minutes, and, and after both of the presenters have spoken for the first time, they will have eight minutes to, uh, for the rebuttal session, and which, uh, which after they will have still more, three more minutes to uh, respond to their, their the, the counter-arguments or, or comments they are presenting. And after that, there will be room for questions and answers um, from, the, from the audience, so uh, interaction with the speakers. So, um, I think without much further introduction, I will uh, set the clock and, and <laughs> give, give the microphone to Dr. Payne. Please, Dr. Payne, it's your turn. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a joy to be back here in Finland. Uh, science and Christianity is a topic I've been interested in for, in for a long time. When one thinks about science and Christianity, the worldviews, I want to define a worldview basically as an overall view of the nature of reality. Not just parts of it, but overall view of the nature of reality. Christianity clearly has a worldview. It believes that God, who is not material, created this world. There's a physical world that we live in. Uh, we as human beings are both physical and there's a non-physical part of us. We're spiritual as well as physical. There's a variety of other things I could say, but one thing I should say here is that Christians believe that God has acted in the world, not only on a regular basis, but also sometimes through miracles, which I'm using in the strong sense of being uh, exceptions to the laws of physics. Uh, when it comes to science, science, I maintain, actually does not have a worldview. Science describes the physical world, but it does not uh, say that it knows whether there's anything beyond the physical world. So in claiming to have an overall view of reality, it's not science that makes that claim. What makes that claim is a philosophical position called naturalism. Naturalism basically says that the physical universe is all that's real and that everything can be explained by physical laws. Now if you stick to science and what science is able to demonstrate, Science cannot answer either of those questions. Just in terms of the methodology of science, it doesn't answer those questions. So Christianity and naturalism are obviously in conflict, but I would maintain that science and Christian faith, in fact, are not in conflict. So my first, I'm gonna give a series of some theses. The first one is that the success of science in explaining nearly everything we observe in the world around us gives us reason to think there are no gaps in the order of nature. Now what I mean by gap is an event in the natural order that cannot and never will be explained by natural laws. So my thesis is there's good reason for thinking there are no gaps in the world around us. I want to this point introduce a distinction between two kinds of miracles. 
The first kind of miracle I'm going to call order of nature miracles. And those are miracles that God has to do in order to fill these gaps. So at various times in the past, Christian says, science cannot explain this or cannot explain that. And it's been part of the natural order and science has been able to explain it. Here's a cartoon that I like. A bunch of equations on one side, a bunch of equations on the other side of the blackboard. And then a miracle occurs. Well, I think there are no miracles that occur that scientists will come across that are needed to fill a gap in the natural order that we see around us. Second thesis is that science is silent about the possibility of specific point miracles. Now, specific point miracles are miracles that are not needed to sustain the natural order. They're miracles that God does at specific times for specific purposes. So they're, they're one-off miracles, one might say. It's important to recognize here that all of the Bibles, all the miracles in the Bible are specific point miracles. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that God needs to do things to make it rain, or that God needs to do things to make the day, the sun rise. Uh, that kind of description saying God makes these things happen on a regular basis, that's not there. The miracles you see in the Bible are miracles done at specific points for specific purposes. The third thesis is that the success of science does not provide strong support for naturalism uh, and rejection of all reports of miracles. Now, one might argue that, okay, science methodologically can't address the question of whether naturalism is true, but isn't there good philosophical grounds for thinking that naturalism is true given the success of science? So science by itself can't make this jump to naturalism, but when one sets science to one side and one asks, is there a good argument that one can give from the success of science for believing that naturalism is true? Is there, is there a good philosophical argument for that? Many people assume that yes, there is. And I want to argue that, in fact, there is no good argument from the success of science to the conclusion of naturalism. Uh, I'm going to have a, I'll see how much time I have. There's some objections that people can have to this claim. Uh, and I'll respond to those either at the end of my presentation here or in the rebuttal. Okay, fourth thesis is that Christian faith not only is compatible with an absence of order of nature miracles, it accords well with it. I should perhaps introduce here that uh, when they say there are no gaps, uh, there's one exception that seems to be the case, and that's the, the nature of mind and conscious states. And I'll come back to that in a second. But apart from that, the normal things that we see within the world around us, it seems to me there are no gaps within the order of nature. My contention here is that not only is Christian, Christianity compatible with an absence of gaps in nature, it actually accords well with it. So Christians believe, one, that God is all-powerful, he can create any possible world. Christians believe that God is all-knowing. He knows all the possibilities. So if God knows one of the possibilities is to create an exquisitely ordered world where he doesn't need to do miracles to sustain it, that's one of the possibilities God has. Uh, and the question is, should we be surprised that God has created a universe which is exquisitely ordered? Now, when we ask that question of God, it's typically a shaky question because we're not God, but at least from a human standpoint, if you're an engineer, and say you're building a machine, and you can build this machine uh, that, would, uh, that we has to be adjusted on an annual basis, or you can build a machine which is self-adjusting. From a human standpoint, the engineering much more elegant solution is to say that, in fact, God uh, to, would be to create a machine that's self-adjusting. And I maintain that God, who, who knows everything, is all-powerful, we shouldn't be surprised, or at least we shouldn't say, well, surely an all-powerful, all-knowing God wouldn't create an exquisitely ordered universe. That seems like a very odd conclusion, given that from a human standpoint, to be able to create a world like that would seem to make sense, or at least from an engineering standpoint, it makes sense. The fifth thesis is whether specific point miracles have ever occurred must be answered through historical investigation and inference to the best explanation. Sometimes science can come into this question, but typically, science does not come into the question. And if science is silent about the possibility of specific point miracles, one has to turn to historical investigation and say, well, let's look at the examples. Is there an example that we actually have that has a strong enough case for it that it becomes reasonable to believe that God has done such miracles? The sixth thesis is a, is a, is a thesis which goes against naturalism itself. And is that, is that there's good reason the problem of mind and consciousness, to think that naturalism is false. 
Conscious mind and personhood do not fit in a world where everything is ultimately physical. Uh, here's a statement from Francis Crick, which I think is a very honest naturalist statement. You, your hopes and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Who you are is nothing but a pack of neurons. A rather bleak view of human nature, but actually fits with the view that says we are nothing but physics. Interesting enough, there is a quite well-known atheist philosopher, Thomas Nagel, in Philosophy of Mind, came out with a book in 2012 by Oxford University Press. The main title is Mind and Cosmos, but the subtitle was the one which grabbed people's attention. The subtitle is Why the Materialist, or Naturalist, Neo-Darwinian Concept of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Part of the reason why he says this, I'll explain it in terms of an article that he wrote some years before this book came out, what is it like to be a bat? The reason he asks this question is bats fly around a cave where it's total, dark, total darkness, but he thinks surely when a bat is flying around a cave, it has some experience of flying around the cave, but it's not going to be visual experience. Bats make these chirping sounds, and the sound waves bounce off other bats, bounce off the walls of the cave, uh, and the bat does not fly in anything. Now, one might think that the bat is totally have, has, has having no experience whatsoever, but uh, most people say bats actually do have some experience, but it's not visual experience. It's something analogous to that because it's a spatial experience. But what is it like to be a bat? Now, if you assume that bats do have some kind of experience, there must be some fact of what it's like to be a bat. But then he says, suppose you knew all the physical facts about a bat. Everything you could possibly know about how, 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 brain, how, its, brain, how its brain works, how sound waves come in, how they get transmitted information processed by the brain, how the bat is able to fly and do all of that. If you knew all the physical facts, would you know what it's like to be a bat? And part of why that's significant, if you're a naturalist and say there's nothing but the physical world, ultimately the only facts you have should be physical facts. But if you follow Thomas Nagel's argument, no, there's a fact of what it's like to be a bat. So therefore, naturalism is wrong in thinking that ultimately there's only physical facts. Uh, this was a, a, cart, a, a news cover that I thought quite humorous. It's a picture of other atheists treating Thomas Nagel as a heretic who should be burned at the stake. Because this is a true atheism. To say that there's something like a natural teleology calls it out there is an abandonment of the, of the true atheist camp. Now, Nagel's critique of naturalism does not imply, that, imply the existence of God, but it does require rethinking our understanding of the nature of reality, metaphysics in other words, so as to include the reality of conscious states and of persons, one might one call the inner self. At minimum, theism and Christianity should be taken seriously. When you ask what kind of metaphysics can replace naturalism and can explain conscious mind and states, uh, Thomas Nagel gives an explanation in terms of natural te teleology, namely uh, things aiming towards a purpose, but he doesn't want to have any conscious persons or agents aiming towards that purpose. Somehow you have nature itself aiming towards purposes without any person aiming towards those purposes. That doesn't make very much sense to me, and he also thinks that has to be there before there are con any conscious beings that are there. If one says you have to rework your metaphysics and bring mind back in the picture, at least a serious option becomes theism, that there's actually a mind behind the universe and has created a universe whose reality is such that it can give rise to mind within it. A summary, and then I'll come back to the first objection because I think I'll have time for it. There's good reason for thinking that naturalism is false and the nature of reality is not just physical. Next the, next, the success of science, far from conflicting with the Christian faith, accords well with it. Next, whether God has performed miracles at specific points in history is a question that must be examined historically. The success of science is neutral with respect to this question. Now, I've actually had time to go through one objection. One objection says that science is able to investigate individual events. In fact, part of the aim of science is to try to figure out why specific events happen. And for many miracle claims, it is it, it, science has been able to show that either the event never happened or that there is a possible scientific explanation. My reply is that false reports of miracles are expected whether or not there are any natu na actual miracles. 
So people have a tendency to want to draw attention to themselves, they'll make up stories, or if people have some belief they want to back up, they'll, they'll think they saw something that really wasn't what uh, they claimed. So one should expect there will be false reports. Next point is many reports cannot be disconfirmed or shown to, be, shown to have plausible natu natural explanation. In fact, if a scientist is investigating an actual report of a miracle, it will not come up with some scientific explanation. But more than that, it won't come up with a conclusion that a miracle happened. So a scientific investigation of an actual miracle would not reveal an actual miracle. It would simply get recorded as unsolved. I suspect that most reports of miracles actually would be in the unsolved category, with some being in the no miracle category, but you would never get a scientist saying a miracle happened. That would never be the conclusion of a scientific investigation. So to say science has somehow shown that no miracles happened, duh. Of course no miracle shows up because by the methodology of science, actual miracles will never be confirmed to be actual miracles. They'll just be unresolved, unsolved cases. Uh, I'll, uh, let's see, I'll have one, we'll have one more. One might ask, well, why is it that if, uh, if, 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 if God does miracles at all, why doesn't he do them often enough so at least scientists would be aware of them? And one might ask, okay, well, it's a good question why God doesn't do obvious miracles more often than he does. I think God does act on a regular basis in people's lives and actually is able to guide people. But obvious miracles are not things which God does on a regular basis. They may, they're events which may be obvious miracles to Christians. Suppose a person is suddenly cured of cancer, or the person says, ah, God did it a miracle. But that's not obvi an obvious miracle because the atheists can say, well, your immune system kicked in. But when you ask, should we expect there to be many obvious miracles, uh, we can't really judge that, judge that by what God would do, because after all, God is a personal agent. Plus, when one looks at the biblical record, obvious miracles do not come as a regular course in biblical history. Obvious miracles typically take place through particular individuals at particular times, and not normally. So when Christians say, well, of course God would do obvious miracles now, no, he doesn't. So it's not in conflict with biblical teaching to say God isn't doing obvious miracles now. That's, that's a typical for the biblical story. There's still a question, why doesn't God do more obvious miracles? But that's not a question which arises out of science. One can get on the problem of evil and suffering, but again, that is not a scientific question. So I think my time is gone. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks a lot. And uh, I think we will move straight ahead to uh, Robert's presentation. So to, to prepare for this, uh, when we are talking of science and Christianity and, and worldviews in conflict, of course, it makes the question, what Christianity are we talking about? What is Christianity? Uh, there are many, many flavors of Christianity, some fighting fiercely, you know, about some interpretation, you know. Uh, there are Catholics, Protestants, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostal, Jehovah's Mormon, and so on. Some even are debating whether some of these are Christian at all or some completely other religion. So, you know, when I'm talking, you know, about Christians, uh, you know, there might be young earth creationists, old earth creationists, guided evolution in, in each topic, you know, of Christianity and Christian faith, there's variation and combination of different kind of beliefs and faiths. So when I'm talking, you know, uh, of what, you know, Christians might think or, or contrasting Christianity with science, I'm contrasting some form of Christianity, you know, that, that might exist. Uh, I don't mean to say that all Christians think in this way necessarily. Uh, and, and my different points might even apply to different forms of Christianity. I don't, I'm not intending, you know, to build a straw man. I, I, I think some Christian will think in, 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 in some ways that I am talking about. So, often we hear, there might be God, or there might not be. Or, science cannot prove that God exists, but science cannot prove that God doesn't exist. So what does that tell? Does it tell, mean that, well, anybody is free to believe whatever they want? No. It depends on the probability. We can equally well say, 
well, dragons might exist or dragons might not exist or unicorns might exist or unicorns might not exist. So everybody is free to believe. But we quickly realize it doesn't make sense. It's, it, or, or let's say in the court of law, we bring some person who is uh, suspected of murder and we can say, well, he might be, might be done it or might not be done it. So anybody can believe what they want. It doesn't go that way. It depends on the evidence and the probability. So is it 50-50? You know, because we have two possibilities. Clearly, it's not 50-50, just because we seem to have two possibilities. Possibility and probability might be much, much smaller or bigger or whatever. It doesn't tell anything yet. So, if I tell there's an invisible dragon in my cellar, it doesn't make it 50-50 probability. You wouldn't believe that. So the point is not that God might exist or might not. The point is not uh, that anything might be true or not. Actually, anything might be true. And that's not even interesting. The question, what is interesting is, how likely is something to be true? That's what one should focus. But still sometimes we hear as an argument saying, yeah, God might exist. You cannot prove that God doesn't exist. But that's a nonsensical argument. That's not argument at all. And, and the same thing is, you know, whether the study of God is scientific or whether it's not scientific. I know some scientists make a big point about this. Oh, we cannot study supernatural because it's not scientific, because it's not, you know, uh, testable and so on. I don't care. We can talk about the probability. We can talk about whether something is likely or not, regardless of this. So the key point is to try to rationally estimate the probability of God or gods or unicorns or Christianity being true using evidence, logic, and the laws of probability. So probability can be complex and tricky. Here are some uh, formulas from Bayesian inference and minimum description length analysis which are important to this Occam's razor principle. But let's look at some cases that will show how difficult probability is for human thinking. There's a rare disease uh, that has a test that fails in 0.1% of the cases. A man comes to the test and the test shows that he has the disease. How probable is it that the man does indeed have the disease? Is it 99.9%? Think about it. Or old couple in the dark evening, I have heard this case personally, see some people with candles in the distance, and they shout hello, and the people don't respond. How probable is that those people were ghosts? They believe they were ghosts. Because it's unlikely to have people carrying candles that don't respond to you in the evening. Or disease is 99.999% deadly. But after receiving treatment and praying to God, patient recovers. What is the probability that God saved him? Now, our intuition might fool us in these cases. If the disease is a rare disease, if the disease is, let's say, in a population one in a million, even though the, the test is 99.9% .9 accurate, there will still be much more false positives in the test than uh, the, the real, real results. So even though the, the test shows the man has the disease, and it's quite accurate test, the probability that the man has the disease is less than 0.1%. Our intuition doesn't tell that. Similarly for these cases, it can be very low probability that those persons were ghosts, and it can be very low probability that God exists regardless of this miracle because of something we call the low prior probability. And this means if there's some really extraordinary claim, like dragons exist, we don't just take some sighting of a dragon and say, okay, now we believe dragons exist. We require really much, really good evidence for dragons to exist, or gods to exist, or ghosts to exist. They are very extraordinary claims, very unlikely claims in themselves, requiring very good evidence to be believed. 
But I will save you from more probability mathematics. I will try to use more metaphors. Let's take a metaphor. This is Minesweeper. It was a famous game in the uh, 1990s on Windows. And here you type click places and there might be a mine and there might not be a mine. So now let's imagine a huge Minesweeper platform and we don't know whether there's any mines there. There might be some mines or there might not be some mines and we are not getting any hints. We are just clicking, clicking, clicking and we are not finding any mines and we keep clicking, clicking, clicking. In the end it looks like this. We have been clicking very many squares and there's some squares that we have not been clicking yet. Now is it likely, is it probable that there are mines still to be found? It's not very likely. It might be that these squares here represent some squares that we can never click, that, that they are hidden from us. And we can always say, well, we have been searching for the miracles and we have been searching and searching and we have not been really finding any good obvious cases. But there might be still some cases hiding. They might be hiding in the history, they might be hiding you know, beyond in the future, they might be hiding in some cases that couldn't, can't be investigated yet. They might be still there. But is it likely that there are still cases hiding there that we haven't found? It's not likely. It's in, in, in fact, when we have been clicking like this and there's these kind of squares left, it is extremely unlikely that we will find anything else than emptiness here. And the reason why it's very unlikely is that if there would have been some miracles or God or whatever here we have been searching, it is very likely when we are clicking them but that we would have been finding it already before. Each time we click, each time we search, and we don't find, the probability goes down. That's important. So, seek and you shall find, but if you seek a lot and you still don't find, it is likely not to be there. It is not probable. It is still possible. And that's what the Christians say. Yes, you know, we haven't found God and God is this and that. And, you know, it could be like that, and God, God could be hiding still in some weird corner or other dimension or whatever, but it's not likely, it's not probable. So this thing we are searching, it could have been anywhere, but all the places we have been searching, we have not been finding it in any obvious way. So it's unlikely. And I can compare this to searching for the UFOs, and here I mean flying saucers of alien beings in our atmosphere. Now, there were many people in the 1970s and 1980s believing you know, in UFOs and believing these alien visitors in our atmosphere. Now, I can ask, why is it much more unlikely now, today, in our world, that these kind of visitations occur than it was in the 1980s? And the answer is cell phones. Why? Because now almost everybody carries a cell phone with a camera and a video camera. So if there would be a UFO flying there, they would just take their cell phone and shoot it. And the fact that we don't see all these videos of flying saucers now in YouTube provides much better evidence than what could have been said in the 1970s, because then people didn't have cell phones. So because people are looking more and they have better tools of looking and recording what they see, the UFOs now are much less likely, I'm not saying they were likely in the 1970s, but they are a million times less likely today, less probable than they would have been then. So the whole of science, the whole of humanity has been searching for good obvious miracles, God, undisputable evidence, you know, evidence, you know, that we can look like this for thousands of years. And we have millions and billions and billions of data points from science, from humanity, from psychology everywhere, and we don't have the obvious evidence. It's like this minesweeper of billion times billion, and, and we have been looking everywhere, and only thing we find is 
crappy, crappy evidence that can be easily explained otherwise. It is said that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, meaning that even if we don't see something, it might still be there. Well, this is not exactly true. It is indeed, it is not evidence of absence in the hundred percent sense. But absence of evidence is evidence of absence in the sense that it will make the probability low when we search and we don't find. So in the Christian religion, uh, it's been during the centuries withdrawing greatly to smaller and smaller and more abstract and abstract fear in its claims. Heaven is no longer a physical place above the roof of the firmament. Ritual hell is not placed anymore underground as it was believed. Adam and Eve, creation 6,000 years ago, almost nobody believes that anymore. Well, some creationists do. God walking in the paradise, you know, in the evening of the cool, cool of the evening, you know, that kind of thing is, is, is gone away. Earth as the center of the universe or, or the solar system, gone away. Men being resurrected with good evidence seems to be a thing of the past. These have been painful losses of Christianity. If you don't believe, you can read articles from the time when these kind of revolutions were happening, and you will see they were fiercely opposed. And many Christians and priests were saying the, the base of Christianity will fall if evolution is true or if uh, actual Earth is not the center of the universe. But it's a miracle almost that Christianity did survive and did become the more abstract, you know, difficult to uh, you know, grasp concept. Okay, Luther was talking about this. So anything is possible, but only few things are probable. Any weird idea can be defended as possible. Flat earth theory, creationism, uh, and even 15-minute creationism. This is my theory that everything was created 15 minutes ago. It's possible. It's possible because it could have been that we were created 15 minutes ago with exactly the memories placed in our heads that we have now. It's, it sounds ridiculous, but it's possible. And it's not much more ridiculous than the young earth creationism that believe that God was creating the light coming from the distant galaxies, 6,000 light years from Earth, so that it would reach us and look old. So, uh, in the so-called scientific court of law, uh, some scientists would be saying, we just throw all the supernatural and God out of the court. We don't even take the case. I, I don't think that should be the case. I think we, we, can, we can study them. But uh, given the evidence, given the success you know, of, of uh, explanations that we have and the probability analysis, we can see that the religions as human created myth is much more likely than supernatural agent, that it's extremely unlikely after all this searching that there would be supernatural God. Thank you. Thank you, Akir. We can do it. And um, now there will be a session where, where um, the presenters will respond to each other's opening statements. And, and uh, the first one will be Peter responding to uh, Robert's presentation. Um, go ahead, Peter. I think the stage is yours. Okay. <clears throat> the reason one believes that a miracle has taken place is not because one has looked in lots and lots of places and not found it. If one thought that believing that some event occurred can be shown to not occur by simply looking lots and lots of places, uh, then we would think, look, we've been looking for the whole history of the human race and no asteroid has been big enough to destroy life on Earth. So therefore, it can't happen. Well, no. <laughs> Actually, we're concerned about it because we believe it can happen. Just simply looking lots of places for it doesn't mean that it can't, ha can't happen. The UFO example. Uh, most atheists I know actually believe there might be intelligent life out there. When we look around us, we don't find examples of it. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't happen. What would cause a person to actually believe that a UFO had come? We have to look at that case and say, well, this case actually has enough evidence behind it that I can believe that it, that it happened. An atheist isn't going to say, well, no, it can't happen because we've had these cell phones. And for 10, 15 years now, we've been, people have not seen it anywhere. So the probability of ever happening has gone down. The probability is much lower now than it was 10, 10 years ago. No, the probability <laughs> is not affected by it at all. And he assumes that if God does miracles, somehow if we keep looking out there, we'll spot it. The problem is, even if you did spot it, <coughs> you would actually believe that it's a miracle because science wouldn't be able to demonstrate it. He says, keep investigating and surely it'll, it'll pop up somewhere. He made the claim that uh, it's not a matter of proof, but a matter of probability. That's a problem in that most of the things we believe are not a matter of a set of premises and conclusion which logically has to be true. Most of the things we believe are because of a set of evidence and then it supports a conclusion. Part of the problem is there's no, problem, there's no formal laws of probability that tells you how to weigh evidence. So when you, when you weigh the evidence, people looking at exactly the same data can come up with quite different conclusions. So when one, one says, well, we need to consider the probability. Well, unless you think there's a deductive argument that says God's going to exist, or you think the more places we look and don't see a miracle, therefore the likelihood of it goes down. No, what you have to do is, there, is there any case of a miracle which has enough evidence behind it to have us seriously entertain the possibility that it'll happen? Now, he said that you, if, 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 if somebody reports a miracle, you shouldn't believe it because that's crazy, that's uh, outrageous. It is true that when one is investigating the evidence for a report of a miracle, one has to talk about background beliefs. I sometimes give a pair of lectures. The first lecture I entitled, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And there are atheists who will grant the case for the resurrection of Jesus is more difficult than they thought before. They're not convinced that actually the resurrection took place. And the way in which one, one, one addresses that is one doesn't assume that the New Testament documents are reliable. Rather, what one does is, well, what do, what do scholars agree upon? What are the facts of the case? So like in a, in a court of law, a murder case, yes, let's gather the facts we have and what kind of explanations can best explain these facts. And if you're quite sure that something's a fact and your explanation, explanation accounts for most of the, the facts, but not for all of them, that explanation is on shaky ground. So what one does in looking at the case of the resurrection, what are the facts that the scholars would agree upon? And then what's the best explanation for that? It turns out, I can't go into it right now, that it's actually a quite good case for saying the best explanation is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. The background beliefs come in when one asks the question, well, well, well a person might object, but dead men don't rise. So I give a second lecture on the philosophical question, what does it actually take to believe in a miracle? Sometimes people say, well, the reason we don't believe in a miracle is no miracle has happened yet that has enough evidence for us for us to, for us to believe it. And I ask, well, how high does that bar of evidence be, need to be? I think the bar of evidence needs to be considerably higher for miracle reports than for ordinary events. But how high does it need to be? That's going to depend in part upon your background beliefs, the, the things that lie in the background. If the atheist says no actual reports of miracles have had sufficient evidence, I, how do you know that? Well, you have to have this enormous amount of evidence to actually believe that a miracle happened. Well, why do you have to have this enormous amount? Well, it's because we have good reason to believe that miracles can't happen. Well, why do we believe that? Science tells us that. No, science doesn't tell us that. And our looking and not having seen miracles doesn't tell us that. All right, so when, 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 is, when investigating miracles, one, has, one has, to, has to look at each individual case and weigh it and see what it come, comes up with. When one is uh, looking at the, the question of whether God exists, and whether, the one way of looking at that is to ask, is naturalism true? If it's not true, then as I said in my opening remarks, the theism needs to be taken very seriously. But there is evidence for, for believing that God exists. One evidence, which can be taken in two different ways, is the evidence of fine-tuning of the basic physical constants. Stephen Hawking, in his earlier book, A Brief History of Time, says the following, and what I'm going to give you is, he actually repeats almost the same, the same idea in the grand design. It says, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electrical charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible for the development of life. 
Many physicists these days say, ah, but the explanation, and Stephen Hawking says the explanation is all possible physical universes actually exist. We live with this M theory, this multitude of vast, vast numbers of universes, an infinite number of them, and, and no matter how improbable it may be, surely we have to be in one of those. When we ask what is more reasonable, there's no objective way of saying that a multiverse explanation is more reasonable or less reasonable, but to say it's just possible that there's a designer, no, there's significant evidence to support it. Another example I want to give, about six weeks ago, there's good friends of ours who are husband and wife, they're both medical doctors. And they have a daughter who, is, who was pregnant. She may have had the baby now, but she was pregnant at the time. She went into the doctor and a scan was done and the doctor said, your baby has this genetic uh, problem and it's inevitably fatal. So the baby is not developing properly. The, the, the friends of ours are doctors and they knew exactly what the doctor was talking about. So it's not a matter of the immune system kicking in right or something like that is gonna uh, cure things. A week later, and then they prayed fervently, a week later, Another scan was done, and the baby was perfectly normal. Now, if I'm an atheist, I'll say, well, surely it must have, must have been a mix-up. However, if there was a mix-up, the doctor would be where there must be a mix-up, and there aren't all that many patients the doctor has seen. The doctor would say, okay, who is the mother that has this bad story they need to tell to? Uh, let me go, go find, look, I haven't found someone yet. So does that mean that, in fact, uh, that, that, that a miracle took place? I would say there's a significant case for it. It's not because, well, it might be possible, but the other explanations seem pretty far-fetched. One might say, well, that's not the best explanation because after all, we know miracles can't happen. We don't know that miracles can't happen. That's assuming, that's assuming that science tells us that and science simply doesn't tell us that. So when one looks at the individual case and asks, what's the evidence? Once you have a much higher bar than for ordinary events because there are a lot of false reports, but at the same time, one shouldn't have an astronomically high uh, bar. And if one believes that actually the naturalist metaphysics is wrong, and one thinks that God may in fact be behind the fine tuning of the universe, plus many other things in terms of human history, where there's a good case to be made for it, I would say that then you, at least from my perspective, there are, there's, much, there's a great deal of evidence to believe that, the, the, that the, the Christian faith is true. He said people don't believe in the resurrection anymore. Now, actually, atheists and Christians are debate, debating that quite fervently, and there's a lot of heat and a lot of uh, conversation around that. Uh, and so that's hardly a, a set case. So I think the, the Christian faith rests on historical examples, and one needs to address those without assuming that miracles cannot happen. There has to be positive evidence. It's not just possible. There has to be strong evidence for these things to occur for you to actually believe they're a miracle. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Robert's turn to respond to Peter. Yeah, on the, on the UFOs and uh, intelligent life. But perhaps I said actually because I need to look at my notes now. So uh, clearly they are they are different things. Uh, it is uh, only some of the you know UFO enthusiasts they are say, mixing the idea of seeing some flying saucers in our atmosphere and the possibility for intelligent life in the universe. I think it's quite likely there might be intelligent life somewhere in the universe, and that's a completely different proposition from seeing flying saucers, uh, you know, spaceships cruising in our atmosphere. And I think it's quite incredible that Peter doesn't agree that the, post, that the, the fact that we are all carrying cell phones and still not seeing, you know, or get, getting evidence for these flying saucers, that that's not evidence against flying saucers. I think that's clearly, I've been clearly demonstrating that is lowering the probability of there being flying saucers. Let's say there's a, it's, it's like having, you know, 10 boxes. And when we don't look at the, you know, inside the boxes, we have no idea what will be inside the boxes. But the more we open the boxes, the, the more we know, and the less, less we still find there, you know, we, we, can, we can say more about something not being inside the boxes. It's, it's, it's quite obvious. Uh, uh, then about the formal laws of probability, it is true that these kind of probability arguments, they are fuzzy arguments. They are not exact 100%, you know, 
logic proven arguments. And these are subjective probabilities. In all of these kind of probability arguments, you must assume, okay, these are the data points, and when we use these data points as input, then, you know, this is the output. But of course, people disagree what are, what are the data points. So it is subjective. It depends what we, what we you know, put there in. But the fact that it's, there's a subjective degree doesn't mean it's nonsense and nothing cannot be said. The same is the, the court of law. The court of law, when it's deciding whether some person is you know, innocent or, or whether, whether he, has, he is guilty of some crime, it's not exact science. They are considering evidence, and there might be some witnesses or some other witnesses, and there might be smoking gun or there might not be smoking. They are pondering and they are balancing these things in a subjective way with whatever data they have. And still, we can make a good case that often the court of law can make a fair judgment, and, and in some cases, of course there's cases where the court of law will, we can show afterward they failed. But in majority of cases, when they consider the evidence in, in a balanced way, they can make a fair judgment on the probability whether the, the suspect is innocent or, or, or guilty. And of course, in the court of law, if they decide that the probability is 60-40, they, they will not sentence him. They will let him go. And, and, and in the US, for example, they say, we can sentence person from a crime if it's likely beyond reasonable doubt that he is guilty. Now, they don't say like, like that the probability should be 99.99 or 99.999. It's, again, up to interpretation what this beyond reasonable doubt means. But, you know, we, we get the feeling, you know, it must be something quite close to one. So we can make probability arguments, and the more evidence we have, even though there's a subjective aspect, and you know, people have some disagreement about what are the data points, there's also a lot of agreement what are the data points. Like we agree there's not much obvious miracles going, going and that's very good piece of data and piece of agreement when, when there's so much you know, uh, people that could have obvious miracles happening to them. Uh, so what kind of miracles would be credible? It is true that miracles, just like the UFO stories, have been classified so far not a miracle or not, not a UFO or then not enough data to decide or something like that, you know, not, not known, unknown. And, and it is true that, that uh, there's no agreed upon case where everybody would agree, yeah, this was a miracle or this was a flying saucer, you know, from another planet. That doesn't mean that we couldn't agree on some case that would be universally accepted as a miracle. And you have been yourself saying that, you know, if an amputee would grow back a limb, you know, with good, you know, demonstration and witnesses and, and documentation before and after, that would be an easy case. Or, you know, if we could get things levitate and fly around, or, or like Jesus said, move a mountain. Why can't we move the mountains? Yes, obvious miracles do not happen. They are all suspicious, you know, murky cases, you know, that leave possible inter other interpretations around. And it, it wouldn't have to be, you know, like, I, I said there would have to be a huge amount of evidence. But for example, for for the establishment that this bottle of water exists here, and this bottle of water, you know, it wouldn't have to all the scientists of the world to come here. You know, we could, we could in a few days establish quite well that this bottle of water exists here. This kind of, you know, no-nonsense evidence for good miracles, it's not there. Uh, Coming, you know, Peter mentioned uh, resurrection of, of Jesus and, and said that there can be a good argument made that it is a likely or probable explanation that Jesus was actually uh, res resurrected. I would compare that to my old friend couple who indeed saw somebody in the distance with the candles who didn't respond. And they said, it's quite likely, it's quite probable, and it's quite a good case that they were ghosts, because it's unlikely that people 
would be walking there at that time with candles and not respond when they said hello. And true, it is unlikely. But to say because that explanation is unlikely, they were ghosts, that, that would be foolish to say. It only makes sense if you already believe ghosts exist and hence, you know, the prior probability is there. If you already believe, you know, there is this all-powerful God and, and, and Jesus was, was his son, then a very good case can be made from the available evidence that Jesus was resurrected, not otherwise. Okay, that was eight minutes. Yes, thank you very much. You still have three minutes after Peter and so. Yeah. And, and Peter now will respond in roughly three, three short minutes and then three short minutes and then the audience. Please, Peter. Okay. Okay, the statement is made that obvious miracles do not happen. I say that mir obvious miracles don't happen very often, but seeing not, and our not seeing obvious miracles taking place around us does not mean that obvious miracles have not happened. I think the obvious miracles have taken, pla have taken place in the past, but again, as I said, the, the biblical history does not lead us the expectation that we will see obvious miracles taking place now. When it comes to the, 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 the looking around as the probabilities, people, do not, people can agree on all the data points and come up with quite different explanations. So the subjectivity does not have to do with the data points, it's how one interprets it. And it's subjective, yes it is, and because of that people can come up with quite different explanations and hence the background beliefs are important. Richard Dawkins once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Actually, extraordinary claims do not typically require extraordinary evidence. There's lots of extraordinary claims which we will believe. We have to have good evidence for it. But it being extraordinary by itself does not mean we shouldn't believe it. Uh, what, what, what a person is going to be strongly uh, disbelieving about some extraordinary claim is because they either believe strongly it did not happen, they're quite convinced it did not happen, or that it could not happen. But when it comes to the question of it could not happen, Science does not tell us it could not happen, so I can't answer the question. When it comes, say, the UFO example, yes, we haven't seen it. I don't think any case actually meets the bar of evidence needed to believe that a UFO has actually appeared. But the fact that we haven't seen them does not reduce the probability that it could happen. So one has to ask, what are the, what are the chances of it actually happening? Is there some reason for believing that it, that it might happen? How high does the bar of evidence need to be? Then one needs to look at the various cases that we have and ask, how does that evidence actually fare? So I think he's, he's, he's failing to recognize that, in fact, there are many cases where there's significant evidence for it. It's not just it might possibly happen. Uh, and that because of the significant evidence that's there, one then can believe that it actually happens. But when you ask how high does that bar need to be, again, it depends on other things that one looks at. And for me, I think when a person says naturalism is false, that it cannot be true because clearly there's an there's a, there's a experience of pain which is not just pain behavior. And if science doesn't, it doesn't allow for the reality of that, or it doesn't allow for the reality of the experience that a bat has, it's missing something vital. It's missing this mental component, which is part of the reality around us. That certainly opens up the possibility that God exists. When you start looking back in the past, and you take examples of stories from, 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 say, the friend that I gave, it's not an obvious miracle to everyone, but I don't think God is doing obvious miracles for everyone. But when you do have good reason to believe that something happened, even if you don't have an explanation for why God doesn't do it more often, that doesn't, that doesn't eliminate the evidence that you have. It doesn't discount the evidence for, for miracles of the past when, in fact, there's good case of it simply because you don't understand why God doesn't do these more often. So levitating bottles and that kind of thing, no, God doesn't do those kinds of things. And the fact that we don't see them doesn't tell us at all whether something like the resurrection of Jesus could have taken place. Thank you. Thank you. And then Robert's uh, final three-minute response. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so philosophical naturalism, the, the assumption that there is, uh, that everything is natural, again, I don't subscribe to it. I, we, we don't have to assume that everything is natural. We can leave, possible, leave the, open, uh, the door open for supernatural, but we just find it unlikely, you know, based on the evidence. So we don't, I, I don't take the burden of proof 
for demonstrating with 100% 100 probability that there is nothing supernatural. It's just the burden of proof is on the claimant who do claim there is something supernatural. Human mind is an interesting topic. Uh, there are many unknown things to the science yet. And for example, the nature of consciousness and how it arises from uh, neurons and whether it arises from neurons uh, is an open question. We don't know it yet. But what we do know is that invoking some kind of supernatural, uh, materialist, you know, cloud of consciousness will not help the explanation at all. If we, at the moment, say we don't understand how neurons give a rise to consciousness, we then do not understand how this unmaterial, weird uh, mind thingy would arise to consciousness. We don't understand that at all better. What we do know is that when the neurons of the mind start to degrade when you get dementia or when you take some drugs and you alter your personality, your memories, your personality, everything you are will be changed by changing your neurons and affecting your neurons. So that's good evidence. It's the neurons and the matter that arise, uh, that give rise to consciousness. Uh, Obvious miracles in the biblical time, not convinced at all. Even if you just take the Gospels, you will see that even the Gospels cannot agree what miracles Jesus was doing, and they are changing what miracles Jesus was doing, and it seems the later we get in time, more miracles are added to the story, which is a good argument that the miracles were added there by the writers as a convenience to, to convince people instead of happening at the time. I mean, the earliest Gospel of Mark, the earliest versions, doesn't even talk of resurrected Jesus at all. And then later versions start to talk about that. In the court of law, that would be damning evidence against resurrection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point, um, we will move on to the questions in the in the audience but hey let's give applause again for this thank you for this 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 rather intensive for a, for a Finnish context <laughs> I mean that was something refreshing indeed more of this please and, um, and uh, um, I have a few questions of my own but I won't present them now because if you have dear audience if you if you have some pressing questions right at the moment. I would like to take them, them first. And I think we will have this kind of microphone here. Ilka, would you please pass it around? And, and you can speak into the microphone. Is this on? Yes, yes it is on. Yeah. So there will be one question on the fourth row or something. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Peter raised the anthropic principle as uh, evidence for the existence of God. And uh, Robert didn't uh, respond to that particular argument. I would just be interested to hear his uh, response. Yep, that's fine. Yeah, again, a bit like the consciousness, we don't know why the constants of the universe are what they are. From this ignorance, we cannot conclude they must be what they are because of this reason, because God created them in this way. That would be argument from ignorance. Now there is speculation why this might be the case. Of course, one you know, uh, argument is that if the constants would be different, then we wouldn't be here sitting asking why the constants are like this. So in a way, it's a circular argument because constants must be, you know, suitable for life in order for us to be here asking the question. But in addition to that, you know, if we go to the speculation, there are speculation, for example, about multiverse, where there could be other universes or other parts of the universe that have different kind of constants that might be suitable for other kind of life or might not be suitable for any life at all. 
But that's, that's speculation. That's, that's possible. We don't know how probable that is, but, you know, we don't know how probable anything uh, other in that, that speculation areas either. Of course, we can say, we, we can come, come, come to the problem, if God created the universe, who created the God? This is, you know, what even five-year-old children learn to ask on the yard. If God fine-tuned the universe so that life could be, who fine-tuned the meta-universe so that God can exist? It's a valid question. And it shows that trying to fix some problem of creation or whatever by invoking God will create even a bigger problem that cannot be ignored if one wants to be honest. Since, since Peter has done his PhD on the topic, would you like to respond? Yeah, to I think for each of the questions, there's a brief response that the other person can res respond, even when there was. So, uh, two, two, two things. Uh, one, that <clears throat> when one is looking at fine tuning, uh, but Stephen Hawking believes all quantum possible universes are actualized. So, every physically possible universe is actualized. Now, that's a huge thing to believe. Why should we think that that is more reasonable, because we, we could go either way, that's more reasonable than thinking that God designed it uh, that way? Again, reason doesn't answer that question for us. When it comes to, uh, let's see, well, there's another point I was going to make um, the, towards the end. I'm uh, getting right up. Uh, that if, if God found you the uni oh, yeah, right, universe, right, 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 who right, finds right, right. God? Right. Bertrand Russell once quoted a, a Hindu sort of myth, a story, not a myth, a story, where this student comes up to the guru and asks, what does the world rest on? And the guru says, the world rests on the back of a giant elephant. Well, what does the elephant rest on? Well, the elephant rests on the back of a giant tortoise. And the student asks, well, what does the giant tortoise rest on? And the guru says, go away. Well, the guru could have said, the world, the elephant, the giant tortoise rest on infinite space. And then the student said, well, what does infinite space rest on? The guru said, ah, you don't understand infinite space by your question. If God were simply another thing out there in the universe, okay, well, what caused God would make sense. But if you're going from finite things to something which is infinite, something which is a totally different category than any finite things, and ask, well, what caused it? You're jumping from the finite to the infinite, not in the same way as spatially jumping from the finite to the infinite. But there's no reason why we should expect that there should be, should be an explanation for that any more than we should expect there should be an explanation of what does the infinite world rest on. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we could take an audience question at, the, at this point. Uh, do you have any there in the middle? Gosh. Thanks for the discussion. Uh, I actually met Dr. Payne a few years ago. We had a discussion on our own. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll ask first the uh, longer one, and if I still have time, and there's no other <laughs> So, uh, my question is sort of an argument against uh, your interpretation of Nagel, right? So, the consciousness stuff. So, let's say that we have someone who uh, believes that conscious states are mere brain states, right? But that person most likely will not believe that my knowledge of such brain states uh, equals to having that sort of conscious state. So for instance, now I see red when I look at the Veritas Forum logo over there. Uh, I don't know because of that what's going on in my brain, right? So no one is claiming that the knowledge of those brain states, that brain state is equal to the brain state of having a conscious experience, right? So from this we can infer uh, that it's possible, uh, metaphysically, ontologically, that uh, uh, the bat, for instance, is in certain sort of a brain state that causes uh, the bat's experiences, right? And we could know everything about the brain states, but that doesn't mean that we have the feeling of being a bat because we're not de facto in that brain state that the bat is in, right? So we can know what the brain state is like without being in the brain state, and therefore we might, might not know what it is to be a bat. So how would you respond to this argument? Yeah. Yeah, there's very good reason to think we cannot know the brain state I'm in when I'm knowing something else. Because at in that, in that moment, uh, I'm not looking at it, and my brain is changing, so I'm not looking at my brain. When I was asking, what's the, does the bat have an experience? The problem is, yes, we, the only way we know would actually to be a bat. But the question is, is there a fact about what the experience, is there a fact about the experience of the bat? From the bat's perspective, is there an experience of the room? When you experience pain, is there a fact about experiencing pain 
which in fact is different than pain behavior in neurons. There's three <coughs> basic ways in which naturalists can respond to the problem of subjective states. One is to say they don't exist at all. So there is no feeling of pain. Others say, well, no, there is a feeling of pain, but it's like two sides of a coin. On one side, you see the physical description. On the other side, you experience the feeling of pain. But the physicalist says there's nothing in the coin, actually, but material. So if you analyze what's taking place, you only end up with the material which is there. The third option is to say, well, actually, brain states can give rise to something which is not reducible to the brain states. You can get, give rise to feelings of pain, say. The problem with that is that if you're a physicalist, then the next state of your brain is determined by the present state of your physical brain. The fact that this, this point in your brain, you feel something, like a feeling of pain, does not affect the next state of your brain because that's all matter, cause and en matter and energy, which is causing the next state of, the state of your brain, the next state of your brain. So each step along, step along the way, you may have conscious states, but the fact that you have conscious states is not affecting the evolution of the brain. If that's true for the feeling of pain, that means that actually having a feeling of pain has no survival value. Now, most of the things that's surely wrong. Thomas Nagel argues that all the higher organisms have conscious experiences. If all of them have it, there must be survival value in it. And to say there's not, which is the conclusion that you have if they're simply products of a physical system, but are not physical themselves, they cannot affect the future, and hence they have no survival value whatsoever, which gives us good reason to think one has to go back down the metaphysics and ask what's going on there and reject the naturalist claim that's all simply reducible to physics. Thank you. Can I pose my next question or? Uh, I will. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll quickly comment. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, when we were talking of, of, of consciousness, uh, my main point was that we don't know how, you know, matter can, uh, you know, uh, give a rise to consciousness, but that doesn't mean it is, it is impossible. We, we might just not know. So just, to, just to illustrate that, if we, if we go back in time and we, we see some cavemen and, and a thunderstorm and they see a lightning striking down, the other caveman might say to the other one, what's that? And, and the caveman says, I don't know. And the first one says, well, it must have been God, you know, sending his hammer, you know, down. And the other says, I don't know. And the first one says, well, if you cannot disprove or if you cannot give other alternative explanation, then this, you know, hammer of God, then you must submit to this opinion that it's the hammer of God. And, and I tell this to show that we don't know can be a valid thing, even if we cannot, you know, comment, you know, on, on, on some other experience. So I can say I disagree uh, with, uh, with this kind of metaphysical, uh, non-material explanation, partly because it doesn't explain much at all, but partly because, I don't know, it's, it's a valid thing. But you do agree that you have to go back to the drawing board when it comes to metaphysics, given my argument, or not? Sorry? Okay, my argument was that either conscious states don't exist at all, or they have no causal power, if you believe there's nothing but the physical world which is there. Maybe you don't believe that there's nothing but the physical world there. Is that the case? So you, you think there might be something beyond the physical world, uh, so you, you're not a naturalist. Is that right? Well, I, I would call... Uh, call it emergent properties. So, for example, water. Water, you know, has some properties that we can measure and we can see that are not properties of the individual water molecules. They arise as properties of the water and its behavior as a whole. So then, does, does for, for example, wetness, let's take wetness. Does wetness exist? Yes, it does exist. Although individual water molecules are not wet, water is still wet. Water, wetness is the emergent property of water. It still doesn't mean that our world wouldn't be a material world, because when we break it down, only thing that remains is the water molecules, and still the combination of water molecules can have this kind of emergent properties. I think we have time enough so that Ilmari can ask the second question and then... Okay, the other one is for, for Robert. So, you already admitted that uh, we're talking about subjective probabilities. So basically the priors determined quite a bit here. So, what prevents the theist of like uh, postulating really, really high prior probabilities to God and whatnot and uh, 
like they could be fully rational in, in both making this sort of claim that the prior is just so high that even though every single evidence that we uh, gather would uh, decrease it, there's still more, uh, uh, the, the prior is so high that it doesn't really matter. So how would you respond to this? Is this irrational and why? No, it's a, it's, it's good, it's a good question. Now there are other uh, you know, formulations of the of the Bayesian model, like the uh, minimum description length model, that actually avoid the uh, the problem of calculating the prior probability, and allows us to compare different hypotheses, you know, and their probabilities based on how much they reduce the data, meaning how much they can find patterns in the data. But that aside, if we only talk of the prior probabilities, then uh, we must ask. What is the prior probability of any existence claim given no data at all? Okay, nothing at all. So, so let's take this hypothetical example that we would have a, a conscious, a, a, a man who's been growing in a barrel without seeing anything, without hearing anything, with no input at all. He, he has consciousness and he's pondering, you know, well, I don't know anything, but what things are likely? So what things are likely or probable for this kind of man? And it turns out everything is very unprobable for this kind of man. You know, existence of earth, existence of, of water, existence of, you know, any kind of object that he can imagine, it turns out the probability is very small. So that means that the, the prior probability of any existence claim from the, in the beginning, in absence of any data to any direction, any evidence, is extremely low. And we require a lot of evidence to lift it from this, this, this valley. And the only reason why we think, you know, believe in evolution and, and, and that, you know, there's a bottle of water here and, and all the scientific laws and all the history. Those things are only made probable because there is a lot of high quality evidence supporting them. Only that rises the probability. So the starting point for any existence claim is very low. And the starting point is actually even lower the more specific and powerful the claim is. So, so this is, you know, the, the Bernard Russell's, you know, teapot. To say that, okay, there's a teapot flying, you know, in the, in the space around Sun, you know, in an orbit close to the Jupiter's orbit. It's possible, but it's an existence claim with no evidence whatsoever. And it can be shown to be extremely uh, improbable in the absence of evidence. But if we say it's not only a teapot, but it's a golden teapot, with some diamonds and rubies and a specific size, that makes it even less and less probable the more fancy things we have. And gold is the ultimate golden ruby embedded teapot, you know, which means that the prior probability of gold is extremely low and we would really require robust, you know, like science level repeatable evidence to, to, to rise it anywhere near existence. I have a feeling that fear has, yes. has something to yes. offer yes. from yep. well, you, that, specifically the prior yeah, probability. Yeah, I, I, I have to save it for the end and then come back to the prior okay. probability. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, gives gives an argument that things which are more complicated are less pro less less probable. Things which are simpler have a higher probability. He says if God knows the whole physical universe, then surely God is is less probable than the universe is simply there as a fact. You see, adding more things. That, the problem with that is that no Christians have ever believed that God consists of a whole bunch of parts. The idea from a probability, you say, what's the probability of something? The more parts it has, the less probable it is, just in terms of the, the number of parts there. Add more parts, it becomes less probable. God in historic theism has no parts. So therefore, to say, use that argument from parts against God is simply to fail to acknowledge what Christians have always believed. Now, Dawkins could say, well, I think the idea of God not having parts just doesn't make any sense. He may say that, but his argument assumes that God has to have parts. If it doesn't have parts, then his argument falls flat. Coming back to prior probabilities, when I was doing my dissertation on the apparent fine-tuning, I thought prior probabilities might work. But then I realized, suppose a person starts off with a prior probability of being one in a billion that God exists. No, not, not a very, 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 very theistic inclined person, one in a billion. 
But then he starts looking at the probability of our universe actually having the physical constants uh, such as they are, uh, and it comes out that it's 1 in 10 to the 40th power, okay? Uh, that person, I don't think, should follow his Bayesian rule and say, well, God exists. I think that person should say, well, when I gave you the 1 out of a billion, that was just drawing a number out of my hat. But my conviction that God does not exist is stronger than my conviction about the prior probability, so I'll simply lower my prior probability. So it doesn't seem to me that Bayesian, his Bayesian statistics are going to help one at all when it comes to these questions, because one does come with certain assumptions about what is plausible, what's not. Clearly what's plausible for Robert is very, very much different from myself, but there's no arguments that he can give that would say the existence of God is, a, is, a, is, a, is an idea which is extremely low in probability. Now, if I had some detailed account of what God was like, then yes, in fact, I have a lot to account for. But if all I have in terms of my belief that God exists is God has done miracles in history, there must be some powerful being. And then later I discover this being is communicating with us, I believe he's actually speaking, and he describes himself as being all-powerful. That is a very, very different kind of conclusion to come to. It's not sort of assuming that it's true and then, then having that as a conclusion at the end, rather saying, let's look at things around us and how do we account for it? And time and time again, the atheist says, but that's an absurd hypothesis. No, it's not absur absurd. In fact, you're an atheist or you're a materialist, then you think your brain makes you think it's absurd. Whereas the brain of the theist makes his, the, his brain thinks that he is, that he is the, he, he's right. If you're, if you're a materialist, then you shouldn't count your own intuitions because your intuitions are not a matter of some independent thinking process. It's what your brain is telling you. So it seems to me just in terms of evaluating theories, you're in a very difficult state if you embrace, embrace materialism when it gets above the, above the issues that, that, that involve simple survival. Would Robert like to respond very shortly? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter whether God is assumed to consist of parts or not. Although, I mean, again, the burden of proof of demonstrating how anything that doesn't have parts could have you know, properties like God, that's a, that's a big burden to show. But even if we say that, okay, God doesn't have any parts, it has still properties, and, and probably anybody understands that it's more likely that some kind of higher power, let's say, it's more likely that something supernatural exists than that a God exists, which is a particular kind of supernatural. And it's more likely that some kind of God exists than a specific guide, like the Hindu God, you know, with the elephant head. Like Ganesha. Perhaps Ganesha exists, but it's less unlikely that Ganesha exists than that any God exists. And, you know, it's less likely that Christian kind of God exists than, you know, any God exists. And it's less likely that the specific style of Christian God exists than any Christian God. So in, in this sense, you know, people do add properties, you know, and more specific properties could, and all of those will take the probability down. You've taken God as being one supernatural thing amongst this whole vast other, other assortment of supernatural things. But if you're thinking about supernatural things as demons or angels or all those ki kinds of things, God is not like them at all. So to put God in the same category as we these things and say he's very unlikely because he's only one of a large category, could be any of these things. No, when you're talking about God, you're talking about a fundamental thesis about some, something that might actually create a whole universe. There you don't, have a, you don't have a whole bunch of other options to look at. You have some very, very simple option to look at and to say that, that, that specific finite things, they have superpowers that are able to do all these. That, that's, that, that's an equal likelihood. There's no way of being able, in a rational way, to say that that is more likely when you look at God. God is actually a simple idea that's found in almost every faith. Almost every faith has some kind of idea of a great creator. And it's an idea that comes to practically every human being and say simply one idea of a vast number of them is to, is to, is to rip, misrepresent the very notion of God and what's contained in the idea of God. No, but Hindus believe in million gods and, and Christians don't. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. But there's some Hindus who believe in one God. And so even within Hinduism, there's that idea. Okay, maybe next question. If you, if you have any in the, in the audience, now sit down. Okay, they're in the uh, middle, of the gentleman with the blue jacket right there. Hello, uh, I'm a very simple person, I think, but uh, I'm uh, starting thinking about these probabilities. Uh, I don't know if we can uh, ever find out if it's uh, if it's likely if anything exists. Uh, uh, but uh, how likely is it that something comes out of 
nothing. Uh, I would say that is highly or 100% unlikely, uh, impossible for our human mind to, to establish. But then uh, uh, we, we heard here that uh, there is uh, this idea of a God who created uh, everything. How likely is it that something that is not just something going around the sun uh, in the universe, like you mentioned this with a golden cap or something on it, actually the world is just like that. It is, it is something more than just uh, stones, it is uh, all these vegetables, uh, this growing green grass, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of animals, there's fish, there's such a lot of things that it's highly, highly unlikely that that would come into being even through some kind of uh, change. It's highly unlikely. And, and uh, so I, I don't have the scientific brain to uh, explain why it is like that. But I've heard enough of that that it's, it is really uh, very unlikely. So the likely thing is that there must be, there must be a cause, and the first cause of everything. And, and that is, it's very likely that it is something that is very close to being some kind of a god. Thank you. Do you have a specific question? Uh, well, I can comment uh, on this I already. Would like to have comments. I can comment. Okay, yeah, comment yeah, probably, yeah. So, so there is a, a fallacy called called lottery fallacy. I can take uh, some dice, and I will start throwing the dice, and I record every number coming from the dice, and I throw hundred times, and I record all the numbers, and I get get the number with hundred digits, and then I ask myself. How unlikely is it that I was throwing exactly these digits? And it's astronomically unlikely, but it still happened. Is that supernatural? Is that difficult to explain? Not at all, because we, do, we look at the numbers after the fact. But if I say, if I write down first the numbers, and then I say, well, I will now start uh, throwing the dice 100 times, and I will check if these 100 numbers come, and if they then come, then it's a miracle. But if I afterwards say, oh, how unlikely this thing was, that's just statistics, that's just looking at the history. There's, there's a famous, you know, uh, metaphor in the, in the internet, you know, for those who believe in evolution. Each one of us is a result of continuous process of evolution for three billion years, where in each generation, most of the species or most of the individuals have died without leaving offspring. But we are representing this continuous successful generations where our parents and parents, parents and so on have been surviving. How low probability is that? And yes, for me as a particular person to exist, the probability is almost infinitely small. But if I wouldn't exist here, there might be somebody else or some other species or whatever, you know, the dice would have been rolling in a different way. So don't confuse looking afterwards what has happened and thinking, oh, this was so unlikely it couldn't happen. Just like, you know, if we do throw a, a, a golden pot to, to the space, you know, that will not create the paradox, you know, because now we have a golden, because we have the evidence that we have a golden pot in space. So this probability argument for the golden pot is only in absence of evidence that, you know, we have no observation, nobody has been doing that, and we still speculate on the probability. Here. Yeah, it sounds like the argument is if you have to get all these factors, the basic physical constants have to be just within these very narrow parameters for life to exist, and you say, well, that every single possible combination is as likely as anyone else. So this combination is no more likely or unlikely than any other combination. It's true, but only one in a vastly huge number of them actually has intelligent life. Now I'm going to say, well, okay, well, just that's the way it happened. Now it seems to me that when you see something that, is, that has significance, it's not just a sequence of numbers on a roll of a die, but actually has, you have a roll of a die and suddenly you have a computer program that's going to run itself, you know, that has significance. So you, when, when you want, one would ask, why is the universe the way in which it is, it's a very, very different uh, example than, than that one. Yeah, uh, but of course the, the, the question that he was asking was about, you know, 
specific things in our history, which is a different question from the fine tuning. Right. Well, he was asked, how do you get something from nothing? Lawrence Krauss, who's a physicist, actually wrote a book entitled uh, uh, "Something: a, a Universe from Nothing." Yes. Uh, why there's something rather than nothing was the the subtitle of it. Uh, and he was arguing that there must be some kind of reality behind the Big Bang, which has no space, no time, no matter, no energy, but which nonetheless somehow quantum mechanics applies there. And there's always a probability that in fact a Big Bang could happen. So he says it's a universe coming from nothing, but it's not absolutely nothing. After all, quantum mechanics of some ultimate theory of everything applies to it. It's not from some absolutely nothing. So the question is, why is it that you would have some physical description of this nothing, which would give rise to a universe? So actually, he's saying that he's, how you get something from nothing, and why is there something rather than nothing? He's, he's building it out of a view that, that you get these quantum fluctuations within this nothingness. There's another problem, is that when we talk about quantum mechanics, we're talking about probabilities. The very notion of quantum me mechanics is probabilistic. So it's the probability of an event taking place with a certain volume of space over a period of time. But if you're talking about what's the probability of a Big Bang happening when there is no space and is no time, the very concept of probability loses all meaning. So the very concept of quantum mechanics loses all meaning. If you can delete probability from quantum mechanics and still have quantum mechanics, I don't say you could possibly have that. But somehow they think that quantum mechanics can still work even when there's no space and no time and no intelligible sense of probability. Some people talk about a space-time froth or foam. Well, where do these bubbles come from? Are they coming from absolutely nothing? Uh, so it's, 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 it's a way of using an analogy that makes sense within our world, but then to say that our world simply came, out that, came, came about that way is, I think, to use something which makes good sense in physics and apply it in a category where it can no longer apply. May I intercede here? Yeah, Sorry. but I was comment on the quantum mechanics. Okay, then, yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, quantum mechanics is, is, a, is a weird, shows us a we very weird uh, view of the world and it shows that we cannot really rely on our intuition in you know thinking on the very big very small very far in the past our intuition will fail us our intuition tells us that everything happens for a reason but the quantum mechanical measurements every day in the laboratories of the world show things happen without reason in space and time well, quantum mechanics doesn't necessarily, I mean, we, we, we shouldn't think of quantum mechanics, you know, just like we shouldn't necessarily think of gravity or, or some other laws as, as this kind of physical thing, you know, that, that somehow at some point there was not this law and then this law is established. It doesn't need to be that, that way. The law describes how things are. That doesn't mean the law needs to be created or that, you know, quantum mechanics is some object that needs to be created. It's just uh, this, our description when we look at the universe, how things behave. And it seems to be rather remarkably that when uh, whereas our intuition says that things must happen for a reason and our intuition says that uh, there are things that can happen, and there are things that cannot happen. By the way, I think there are events that take place without a cause within physics. I'm just suggesting it doesn't apply to the universe itself. Yeah. But it might very well apply to the universe itself. Uh, you know, I have been reading the same Lawrence Cross book, and again, there's, there's many steps, you know, backward, you know, to get more you know, simpler and simpler. But, but the theme of the physics seems to be that thousand years ago, we had a lot of things to explain. And at that point, God was a more reasonable explanation. But then when science has been progressing, we have less and less things to explain. We have less and less things that are beyond the scientific explanation that is shrinking all the time. We have no reason to expect that we would come to stand at some point, you know, we have, you know, although, although, you know, Peter doesn't ascribe to the God of the gaps, we still have the gap of knowledge in the beginning of time. And that's still a gap, you know, many Christians want to cling to. But it's still a gap, you know, that science might very well fulfill. We have no reason to assume otherwise. Since we got to the uh, point of the, the beginning of the cosmos, I would like to uh, ask both of you that 
on what conditions um, could um, God have some sort of predictive power, let's say, to uh, to account for the for the existence of this particular kind of kind of world. So 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 I'm asking that uh, could there be any way that 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 the world could function as as evidence uh, as for, for God? But it doesn't function in predictive power in the way in which scientific explanations do. But in any way. Yeah, so it is predictive power in that, in fact, if there's intelligent being that cares about intelligence, as intelligent beings uh, likely would, or at least it's plausible to us that intelligent beings would care about other intelligence, that God would create a universe where intelligent life can arise. It's predictive power not in the sense that you can somehow do some scientific experiment. So it's not like predictive power in science. So it doesn't make the hypothesis that God created this universe into a scientific hypothesis. It's quite different from that. Okay, Robert. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it could be considered to have predictive power, you know, especially if we assume Christian God, but the Christians are master of wiggling out, you know, from any conclusions of this kind of predictive power. For example, if we look at the Old Testament, you know, creation story, that would make sense. If I would be all-powerful being, and I got the idea, I want to create some beings in my own image, you know, like me, like thinking beings, then I would snap my fingers, make some earth over here, I would put it to the center of the universe, why not? It's the most important species I'm going to create. I wouldn't necessarily create billions and billions of galaxies. Who cares of the billions and billions of galaxies? I would create this planet, and I would create the humans there, like in the story, and perhaps I would create some other species, you know, for, the, for this man, man and woman, you know, to take care and garden. I wouldn't definitely say, oh, I want to make this human, but perhaps I just create some cells in this planet, and they will evolve in three billion years with some random, you know, evolution, and perhaps some man will come out of that. I wouldn't do that. I, that, I, I would predict what the Old Testament says, something like that. And I wouldn't predict evolution. I wouldn't predict billions of galaxies. But of course, the Christians can say, well, you know, God is all powerful. So if he chooses to do it this way or that way, you know, it's up to him. But I don't think we would expect that really. The universe that is necessary for supporting life as we have it is something which I think God would create if God is creating an ordered universe. And say, well, look at all this waste space. Well, from God's standpoint, there's no waste. God could create a vast universe. There may be intelligent life beyond us. We don't know. But to say God wouldn't create a universe which is ordered, and that order is actually needed for us to create uh, planet Earth with maybe the sun with nothing else around, I don't think that could be an ordered universe like God has created. So to assume that God could create sort of a microcosm of our universe and have it be an orderly universe like we see, uh, that's a hypothesis that uh, doesn't make sense to me, or at least one should, one should be very dubious about that. What yeah. do you mean by an ordered universe? There is not, no, no order in the universe at all. Everything will be destroyed. Well, if it's destroyed, there's order which is being destroyed. Everything will be destroyed. All right, but everyone, every, everybody, person, a scientist I know, agrees there is order in the universe, and science is trying to understand that order. Yeah, but there is nothing perfect in it. Uh, but every, every, everything will be stars exploding and, and mixed. Yeah, but you mean, you mean like the natural laws or this kind of order? Oh. I, I'm trying to figure out what, what his, his, his question is. Do you mean like the order of the natural laws? Or? No, no, no. But it seems like Peter would uh, argue that the universe is in some way perfect. But anything changes there. Nothing is uh, ready or, or, let's say, uh, stable there. Everything is mixed. Everything will be destroyed eventually. Yeah, by, by, by perfect, I'm not saying so that... The, the, I mean, obviously, I don't think the universe is perfect. I think there's a lot of bad things that happen amongst human beings, which are not perfect. But if you're talking about perfect, could God have created an order of nature, which would give rise to intelligent life, and have it be an order of nature different than the one we observe? I don't know. Now, I don't know what heaven, heaven will be like. It'll be new heavens and new earth. I know that there will not be suffering and death for human beings. What that world will look like, I don't know. This could be vastly different than ours. Yeah. I don't know. Do, do you want to comment on this, this evolution thing? Like, why the hell would God create humans through three billion years of evolution when he could just create them like that? Doesn't make any sense. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't see why the length of time is going to be uh, no, no sense for God. God has no, no uh, lack of time. For God to have uh, three billion years for life to develop here on the earth, well, well that's, a, that's a waste of time. If God wants it, he should do it right away. Well, I think God wants lots of other things which are included besides us, so it's not just us. And for God to take lots of time in doing it, have a natural process, I have no difficulty with God using natural processes to accomplish something he wants. Any other questions from the audience? Not at the moment, at least. Be brave, be brave at ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have some questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just became curious, you know, if Robert thinks uh, there might be life on other planets or in the universe. Yes, I think there might be life elsewhere in the universe. Now, it's a very good question what probability, you know, that is, is there that, that there might be life elsewhere in the universe. Now, here, uh, the problem is that from all the planets of the universe, and nowadays we know there's many planet, other planets in other stars as well, we have just sample of one having life. So, so uh, normally in this kind of situations, you know, we would have a sample of million planets and 10 of them would have life. So we could say, okay, 10 in a million has life. But now it's very difficult when we have just one sample, it's very difficult to say what was the probability of life happening on, on Earth. Was it, was it you know, I, I mean, it, it wasn't probably, you know, 100%. We, I mean, we, we still see planets in, the, in our solar system that don't have life, you know, so we can say, okay, it's probably not 90% that the planet will have life, you know. Perhaps, you know, we could safely say it's less than 1% probability that life happens on a planet, perhaps. But, you know, even if we say less than 1%, it could be one in a billion or one in a billion, billion, billion. And if it's one in a billion, 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 even though there's billion, billion planets in the universe, they might, we might still be just the only planet with life. Now that said, if we look at the, 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 the early evolution of life and these uh, ab abiogenesis, you know, like the, the models, how these, you know, inorganic processes on Earth were, were, were leading to organic molecules, you know, and, and uh, there, there seem to be several different pathways that, that are possible for the production of replicated molecules, meaning life, from, from, you know, inorganic processes. So in that sense, and, and, and those processes uh, are expected to be likely, you know, on some planets at least. So, so uh, given that at least, you know, we cannot say it's extremely unlikely, but, but uh, it's difficult to say. Yeah, this illustrates the problem of trying to figure out probability by not seeing it here, not seeing it here, not seeing it here. Not only do we not see it within our solar system, but there's been no radio waves coming from intelligent life elsewhere. And if we see if there's, a, if there's life elsewhere, and intelligent life elsewhere, surely some of them got to where their radio transmissions are possible, and those radio waves will be traveling through space and coming to, we haven't found that. Well, does that mean the probability of life elsewhere, the probability is there's no life elsewhere? No, you, you can't, it's not a matter of failed instances of seeing something, that doesn't tell you the probability whether it could happen somewhere. So the idea that you get a probability about what could happen by simply counting up cases doesn't work. I don't think this can be compared because we have not been able to go really and look at other planets to the extent that we would. We have been just finding very recently in our history that there are planets on other solar systems, uh, exoplanets, but we know still very little from them because we have been measuring their existence in very indirect ways. We have not been able to look at them with our telescopes even to see whether there are molecules in their atmospheres. So, so I disagree that we have been able to look there, look there and look there regarding life on other planets. Only in our solar systems we have been able to do it. Yeah, so it's possible that life it develops in lots and lots of places. But almost never, not in a whole galaxy, that ever develop intelligent life where radio transmissions are issued. But if, in fact, there's life on millions of planets, and if you think the development of intelligent life is something that's going to happen in a number of places, we don't have any evidence of that. 
Yeah, we don't have any evidence, and and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't tell us the probability of life elsewhere. That this is improbable. There's life anywhere else. It just simply tells it that we're, it's very improbable. It's not that it cannot happen. Likewise, not seeing a miracle doesn't mean miracles can't happen. Yeah, we we definitely know it is improbable. You know, but whether it's improbable like one in a billion, which means it is still common in the universe, or whether it's so improbable. That we are the only case in the universe that we have difficulty in distinguishing now, with with our limited limited observations. Any questions? Because if you don't, I have one. <laughs> but yeah, you can ask later. But one question: um, Robert raised uh, a few times this point about uh, the, the God proceeding as an explanation when yeah. science proceeds. And um, I was thinking about uh, various versions of naturalism throughout history, which some versions of, of them in, in the ancient Greek, for instance... Uh, versions of what? Uh, of naturalism, that, that okay. would, could be labeled as naturalism. Well, at, at least non-theistic, let's say. Okay. And, and, and many of the versions uh, regarded the material universe quite irrational and, and un unexplorable. I, I would like your response on, 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 on the... Uh, process of science, pro progress of science. Um, should it, why should it be regarded, um, or should it be regarded in favor of naturalism, or in fa or, or or against uh, the God hypothesis? Let, let's say, and and what what would be the exact reasons for that? My my argument was simply that there are no gaps. I think it's a good case to say there are not gaps. Maybe conscious will be a, a gap. But there are no gaps in the natural process taken around us. That's what the success of science tells us. But the success of science filling in these gaps doesn't make God improbable. It's simply if God has created an exquisitely ordered universe, the question is, has God done miracles at specific times as for specific purposes? And that's a separate question from the one the science is able to answer. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when, when we go back a thousand years, the, the let's say the world of you know religion or the God explanation indeed was much much bigger and when uh, when we have been investigating various phenomena uh, often the starting point has been some kind of supernatural assumption like you know they, it was believed that that life like humans or, or some animals they cannot move just by by you know some kind of physical forces but there must be some kind of Vitalism, you know, some kind of supernatural life essence, you know, embodied uh, something that we can still see in the remain of the of the consciousness thinking. But earlier, earlier generations were thinking that even muscles, you know, this cannot be some some you know physical physical thing. And there was this vitalism, you know, assumption, and and, and often that has been the starting point of investigation. But not of Judaism or Christianity. What? Not of Judaism or of Christianity. Not of Judaism and Christianity. Not of Judaism and Christianity. There's nothing in the Bible that says God is a God who makes all these processes work supernaturally. Okay. Uh, so it may be true that in many cases people have invoked God to try to explain physical processes, but that's not the reason why Jews and Christians invoke God. They believe they invoke God because they believe God has acted within history in ways that point to his existence. Well, uh, again, it, it might not have anything to do with God, whether you believe there's, you know, some, you know, vital... Thing, fluid, you know, moving your muscle. It's just the supernatural versus natural explanation. When you don't have any natural explanation, when the investigation hasn't been progressing far enough, like with the lightning of the cavemen, you know, people tend to invoke supernatural explanations. That's partly because we are beings who psychologically have great unease with saying, I don't know. Our, our psychological machinery as produced by the evolution wants us to know. We want to have an answer because we feel very, very insecure if we don't know, don't know, don't know. So, so then, you know, humans in all societies, in all the world, around the world, in history and still today, when they don't know, they will invent an explanation. They will invent knowledge and then they will believe in that invented thing and tell that invented thing like it would be the true thing. Yeah, sounds to me as you're starting off with a hypothesis that a religion arose out of ignorance as to how natural processes worked. But when you actually look at the data of how Judaism and Christianity arose, that is not the case for them. So you're being, being driven by a hypothesis rather than actually looking at the data of how religion arose amongst Jews and amongst Christians. No, Christians did believe in, you know, all these 
concrete things like the concrete heaven and concrete hell and all these things, you know, in the past. Yeah, they, the ancients all had this ancient cosmology, but I maintain that's not the message of Genesis 1, and nowhere is God a being who is miraculously supporting this, this, this dome or making the, even the physical world as they understood it back then sort of hold together rather than fall apart. Yeah, have, got, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, we have time for one, one question in the audience, and then we will have to call it an end. Is there any last question? Maybe last statements. Or, maybe or, last, or last statements, statements. Yeah. that's also possible. I can like check if I have still something in my notes that I didn't yeah. didn't address. Maybe, yeah. maybe Peter would could go with the last statement when Robert is yep. searching his yep. notes. Yeah, I don't think the question of whether God exists or not is something that can be answered by probabilities. There's no probability that gets you to naturalism. There's no probability that gets you to God. What you do have are inferences of the best explanation based on facts or things you have good reason to believe. For Christians and for Jews, the reasons to believe are things which have actually been recorded in history. Now, that doesn't mean you should assume that the reports are, are, are genuine. You have to ask, are there reports that actually have a good case for saying God acted in this way and a miracle took place? If you believe that any miracle has taken place, that changes how you view the other cases. Because now suddenly you realize there is a God who's able to do these miracles and the bar is going to be lowered some, but it still should be higher than for just ordinary reports because you have to weed out the false reports from the good ones. When it comes to the Christian faith, it really centers on Jesus Christ and what he was like and the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the crucial miracle for Jesus. But it has to be investigated historically without bringing in assumptions about what could or could not take place, which is the usual argument that's given from science against Christianity. Yeah, and I'm perhaps exceptional scientist in the sense that I don't set any limits what could or could not happen. I, I take, I, I, I'm just, I open to all possibilities. That doesn't mean I will accept all possibilities as likely. There's a, perhaps I can conclude with this famous uh, quote, but I don't remember from, from who it is. Somebody might help, but, but this is between, uh, you know, atheist and, and, and Christian. And... Uh, often, you know, when we are having debate between atheist and Christian, we are thinking these are the possibilities, but these are not at all the possibilities. There's millions of possible different religions, both the current religions, all the gods of the current religions, all the past religions, the past different superstitions, and all the future possible religions and superstitions. They are all possible, you know, and probable in the same level, you know, as, as some other religions. And people in the past and currently and in the future have been believing in those different kind of religions and different kind of gods in the same way and with the same argument with this, uh, as, 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 as Christians. And so, so in a way, I can say to a Christian, we are both atheists because we are both atheists in regard to those millions of other gods that you don't believe in. You don't believe in Ganesha. And you have good reasons not to believe in Ganesha. There are many people who believe in Ganesha. But actually it's very unlikely that Ganesha exists. And we can make good arguments. And I think Peter would very easily accept those arguments as good arguments. But the same arguments apply so that I am atheist also to the one god that you are not atheist for. Well, I think we can continue the debate on, on the coffee, because there is coffee outside. outside. And uh, I believe you have been uh, dealt with the feedback forms, right? So please, please fill in those and, and return those to, to somewhere. Yeah. And yeah, somewhere where they're supposed to be. So let's give a big hand to our speakers.